Tonight on ABC and iView, Gardening Australia explores Sydney's serene Chinese garden of friendship. Then Father Brown and new line of duty. Meanwhile, on ABC Comedy, Rowan Atkinson stars in the Roller King Regency romp Black Out of the Third. Then it's Workaholics. Taking the rap, Donald Trump has a bizarre encounter with Kanye West as he blames investors for the ongoing instability on world share markets. Also tonight, Me Too. Labor backs the Coalition's tax cuts for small and medium businesses. Battered and bruised, a Queensland mother shields her baby after becoming trapped in a violent hailstorm. And a surprise letter from the palace raises the morale of drought-affected wool growers. Yeah, I opened it up and sort of got a bit of a surprise and yeah, it's a letter from the Prince himself, Prince Charles. Good evening, Ian Henderson with ABC News. Now, let's have another go at this. The Australian stock market has struggled into the black today despite another sea of red ink on Wall Street. However, after a week in which world markets have lost trillions of dollars, no one thinks the worst is over. Andrew Robertson reports. Traders unwinding at the end of another bruising week on the stock market, which has wiped about $90 billion off the value of Australian shares. It's been a tough week, but um, markets uh, don't always get it right. While the Australian stock market entered the day slightly in the black, no one thinks the worst is over. It is the case, though, that the ducks are lining up in terms of a bearish outlook. Continued fears over interest rates and trade wars saw another big sell-off on Wall Street. After six consecutive days of losses, the S&P 500 has shed 7% or nearly $2.5 trillion. That's more than the entire value of the Australian market, which lost 5% over the same period. <laughs> I love this guy right here. Yeah, really yeah. As markets were awash with red ink, President Trump was entertaining his new best friend in the White House, rapper Kanye West. First enduring an eight-minute rant. It was something about when I put this hat on, it made me feel like Superman. You made a Superman. That was, that's my favourite superhero. And then giving the US central bank a bad rap of his own. We have interest rates going up at a clip that's much faster than certainly a lot of people, including myself, would have anticipated. I think the Fed is out of control. I think what they're doing is wrong. The futures market is predicting better news tonight to end the week on Wall Street amid signs that in the short term at least, the sell-off may be over. I think a lot of people are expecting a strong earnings season out of the US with 20% earnings per share growth. Shares are a major part of most people's superannuation funds, which begs the question, when the stock market is falling, what impact does that have on our super? In the short run, there'll be some bumps along the way, but of course, superannuation is a long-term investment. So over the next 10 or 15 years, I think everyone will do just fine. If you're retiring in the next two to three years, though, your super may not have enough time to recover from those bumps. Andrew Robertson, ABC News. Small business will definitely get a $3 billion tax cut within three years after Labor today pledged its support for the measure, announced by Prime Minister Scott Morrison yesterday. As Andrew Probin reports, Bill Shorten said he was compromising in the national interest. Well, we're getting your taxes down. You're doing a good job. The market for tax cuts has been a little crowded and chaotic of late. And get your taxes down. Yes. There have been lots of offerings, some more enticing than others. But the recipe Scott Morrison's arrived at... Here you go. Who's up? Beautiful. On your train. Thank Next, you. please. ...seems to have hit the sweet spot. It's fantastic. It's going to help us uh, reduce our costs. Yeah. Um, it's going to help us employ more people. We're not going ahead with those big business tax cuts. What we're doing is focusing on the small and family businesses that are really the backbone of this country. A contention that found that rarest of political commodities, agreement. Labor has always been a friend of small business. Bill Shorten throwing opposition support behind the government's tax plan. I'm pleased to say that Labor will support a tax cut for small and medium enterprises 
matching what the government's proposed yesterday. Doesn't matter who wins the next election, they'll have the same tax rates. Isn't it great to see bipartisan support for something that really matters? The cuts will give five million businesses tax relief worth just over three billion dollars and they'll be fully delivered in 2021, five years earlier than the government had legislated only a year ago. That may give them $7,000, it may give them $20,000 or $30,000 to reinvest in the business, to buy some equipment, which you'll need someone to operate, to turn part-timers into full-time. Bill Shorten marks his fifth anniversary as Labor leader tomorrow. If today shows us anything, he's determined to make it his last anniversary as opposition leader. And any attempt by the government to wedge him on tax cuts or anything else is likely to be ruthlessly dispatched. Now it's Mr Morrison's turn. Reverse the cuts to public schools. Reverse the cuts to hospitals and do something about climate change. Bill Shorten can't be trusted, Labor can't be trusted and small business knows it. A game of one-upmanship in prospect from now until the next election. Andrew Proben, ABC News, Canberra. Well, as you may have noticed, we made a bit of news of our own last night for all, all the wrong reasons. Seven minutes into what was to have been my final bulletin, a catastrophic technical failure blacked out our studios for several hours. So I'm back for an encore performance tonight. And we'd like to say sorry for the confusion and lack of an explanation last night. Everyone was really scrambling to try to figure out what had gone wrong. Our technicians have assured us tonight's bulletin is safe, so thank you for tuning in. Fire engulfed a gas cylinder business in Melbourne's eastern suburbs this afternoon. One man was injured and, as James Hancock reports, exploding gas bottles caused the roof of the factory to collapse. Again and again, explosions shook the Kilsyth factory. The gas cylinder business was quickly engulfed just after lunch. The gas cylinders involved in fire, uh, they tend to uh, expand rather, rather quickly with the gas inside them and uh, become a little bit like skyrockets. Cars parked outside caught a light, but firefighters spared an adjoining business from the inferno. Workers inside the Canterbury Road factory when the fire took hold, making a lucky escape. A man was burnt in the fire and taken to the Alfred Hospital to be treated. Tonight, he's in a stable condition. Nearby businesses were evacuated and an exclusion zone set up, with residents in the path of the smoke urged to close windows and doors. The structure is starting to buckle, which means that it's not safe to put our personnel in. So we've had to uh, take an external firefight at this point in time. What set off the fire is not yet known. James Hancock, ABC News, Melbourne. Premier Daniel Andrews headed to a key marginal electorate in the La Trobe Valley today, promising more than $200 million to upgrade the local hospital in Traralgon. It's in the middle of the seat of Morwell, which, as Richard Willingham explains, may be crucial to the result of November's election. Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Premier Daniel Andrews was in textbook campaign mode in the Latrobe Valley, promising $217 million to upgrade the local hospital. Our vision of health in regional Victoria is getting all the things that you need as close to home. The expansion includes more beds, new operating theatres and extra emergency capacity and takes health promises beyond $2 billion this campaign. This pledge is aimed squarely at the marginal electorate of Morwell, held by Nationals turned independent Russell North by just 1.8%. The seat has been under pressure for some time, with the closure of Hazelwood last year compounding local economic and social issues. Unemployment is above the state average. There are some people in this community that do it tough, uh, but there's a sense of hope and optimism, a real sense of confidence in the Latrobe Valley today that I don't think we've seen for a while. There's a good chance whoever wins Morwell could decide who forms government. It is one of eight seats the coalition needs to win to take office and Labor is making a big effort to win it. While a victory for an independent or former Senator Ricky Muir will be pivotal in the very real possibility of a hung parliament. The incumbent Russell North is yet to decide if he will run. Morwell's going to be a complex contest. There's several candidates in the running. It may well be that nobody gets more than 30% of the first preference vote. So it's going to depend on the order they get knocked out and how the preferences flow between the candidates. The coalition is fielding both a national and liberal candidate. Today, the opposition was in Morwell with a $9 million promise for business innovation grants. We need to ensure that we um, decentralise the whole of Melbourne. Valley voters can expect the promise of many more jobs over the next six weeks. 
Richard Willingham, ABC News, Melbourne. Supercell thunderstorms have left a trail of destruction in southeast Queensland and a multi-million dollar damage bill. Farmers have lost crops and livestock and several homes were all but destroyed. And as Lexi Hamilton-Smith reports, one young mother risked her life to save her baby in a violent hailstorm. Safe and sound after the most traumatic day of her life. I'm going to smile. You gonna smile? Baby Clara has bruises on her head and legs. They don't seem to worry her. Mum Fiona Simpson looks like she's been beaten in a brutal attack, but these horrific welts are all from hail. So big it smashed her car windows as she pulled over when the massive storm cell hit Kingaroy, about 200 kilometres northwest of Brisbane. I could see her, she was screaming, but I couldn't even hear her, it was just so loud. With the back window caved in, this quick-thinking mum climbed into the back seat and acted as a human shield for her baby. The survival instinct, like when you're a mother, you just you protect your child. There's no hesitation. You just do it. The tornado-driven hail also injured a local camper as it tore his sight to shreds. The devastation across the region is heartbreaking. To the north in Tansy, poultry farmer Leanne Jerry lost 800 chickens when her sheds were blown away. The damage bill is $300,000 and she's only partly insured. Probably can't afford to replace the sheds. Mirabra pineapple grower Colin Hawken has lost 85% of his crop. It's probably set us back at least five years. Dairy farmer Brian Tesman's also in need of help after the wild winds tore off the roof of his home and hail smashed his dairy and silos. That silo there is completely, completely a write-off. About a thousand insurance claims have been lodged so far. The region is still in shock. We haven't found the roof yet, it's not even in the paddock. While the massive clean-up continues. As for mum Fiona, she says it's been a lesson learnt never to drive in a hailstorm. Her precious Clara alive and well after a nightmare battle with Mother Nature. Lexi Hamilton-Smith, ABC News. In Kazakhstan, a Russian spacecraft has had to make an emergency landing just 90 seconds into its flight to the International Space Station. Two crew members were taking off for a six-month stay in space when a booster problem caused their capsule to make a rapid descent. The two astronauts, a Russian and an American, landed safely. But as Linton Besser reports, it's left a question mark over future manned missions. Two, one. Engines at maximum thrust, lift off. And there is lift off of the... From a Soviet-era base in Kazakhstan, the two-man crew headed to the stars, en route to the International Space Station. Liftoff appeared to be successful, but soon after takeoff, the spacecraft carrying Russian Alexei Ovichinin and American Nick Haig encountered difficulties. The uh, emergency, the failure of the booster. The emergency occurred as the first and second stages of a booster rocket separated shortly after launch. It entered a what you, what you call a ballistic uh, landing uh, trajectory, and and uh, and about 34 minutes after after that abort was declared, the crew uh, touched down safely. The two men were recovered and taken for medical tests, but appeared unharmed. It was Nick Haig's first mission to space. The details will be considered and reported on by the Emergency Commission. In such circumstances, the pilot-controlled launches are halted until the investigation is carried out. Since 2011, Russian rockets have been the only way to bring new crew members to the International Space Station. However, the US has announced plans of a test flight in April next year. Linton Besser, ABC News, London. At least two Australian tourists are among the injured after a bus crash in southwest Germany. At least 18 people were hurt, nine seriously, when the coach veered onto the wrong side of the road and collided with a truck near Heidelberg. Helicopters and ambulances raced to the scene. German authorities are still working to confirm the nationalities of the 35 people on board the bus. Back home now to a gesture of support that's lifted the spirits of drought-affected sheep farmers. It was only a letter, but it came all the way from Clarence House in London. 
And one Gippsland sheep grazer was so touched that he's framed it and put it in his shearing shed. Dry times mean farmer Tim Paulette has come to dread receiving bills in the post. But after another long day in the paddock recently, the mail delivery included something most unexpected. Yeah, I opened it up and sort of got a bit of a surprise and yeah, it's a letter from the Prince himself, Prince Charles. It's one of the worst droughts Tim Paulette can remember and it seems the heir to the throne is keeping tabs on the situation. He says, like right off at the start, um, you know, the worst drought on record in the wool growing regions of New South Wales, parts of Victoria, Queensland and South Australia. And very quickly I thought to myself, he's on the other side of the world um, and he's recognised that there's dry times here in Gippsland. The letter has boosted his spirits. His grandmother, who's approaching 100, was expected to be the first in the family to be acknowledged by royalty. I think it'll be a bit of a running joke around the next uh, Christmas table function. While a letter may not seem like much in the middle of such a devastating drought, mental health experts say acts like these can make all the difference. We know that if someone is experiencing a difficult time, a simple gesture such as a postcard can actually make a huge difference. So certainly a letter from the Prince of Wales um, is, is a level above a postcard. Tim Paulette plans on giving the letter pride of place in his shearing shed. In the corner like that. The good times will come again and this can just be a bit of a reminder that, yeah, one time well, things were a bit tough and, yeah, royalty from the other side of the world took, showed an interest. <laughs> A welcome distraction from a harsh reality. Isabella Pitaway, ABC News, Toongabby. Police have found the body of an Aboriginal ranger who was taken by a crocodile at a remote outstation in the Northern Territory today. Authorities say the attack happened around 10 this morning. A ranger employed by the Lanapoi Homelands Aboriginal Corporation was working at the time. Her employer reported the incident a short time later and her body was found late today. Police have travelled by road and boat to the site of the attack which occurred at the Gangan -Gan outstation, 177 kilometres southwest of Nullanboy in northeast Arnhem Land. It was reported to us that a woman was fishing uh, and collecting mussels in a billabong with uh, some family and that uh, the family noticed she, she was missing and the bucket that she was carrying uh, was found nearby. Police are yet to release the woman's identity. The small town of Stanley in Victoria's northeast is taking on a multinational beverage company over the mining of its groundwater. Drinks giant Schweppes Asahi has a licence to extract water from nearby farming land and it's recently won a court battle over the issue. So now Stanley's farmers are trying to have the water regulations changed. Geoffrey Fryer moved to the quiet community of Stanley six years ago. He was looking for a relaxed rural lifestyle, but he's ended up in a fight against a global beverage giant. There was something cynical about the buying of the property across the road from me and the way that the water has been extracted from it. Schweppes Asahi has a licence to extract 19 megalitres of groundwater each year to be bottled and sold in Australia and overseas. The whole water industry, and it is an industry, it's an expensive resource now as it becomes scarcer, the whole industry really needs to be reviewed. No water, no farms, no food. And the anger from Stanley has now spilled into Melbourne. The true David and Goliath story. A busload of farmers from Stanley arrived in Melbourne today, armed with 125,000 signatures, demanding Asahi stop mining their water. We want water to be used for food production, not, not put in plastic bottles and sent off overseas. Asahi has released a statement saying, we responsibly manage the water sources we use to ensure the impact is minimised. Stanley residents have acknowledged that water extraction here is legal and lost an appeal in the Supreme Court in 2017 to have it shut down. But that hasn't stopped them from taking on the bottled water industry as they continue to push for legislation to have a better say in where their water is taken from. To be taking water away from a place that has no backup of any kind is really quite irresponsible and unethical in my view. It's a fight that promises to bubble along for some time yet. Erin Somerville, ABC News, Stanley. 
Returning now to the detail of this week's market turmoil, and as Emma Alberici reports, the Australian market's resilience was largely due to some special Friday deals. After falling sharply at the open, bargain hunters ensured the All Lords closed pretty much where it started. A mixed bag for the banks, an embarrassment for ANZ boss Shane Elliott, who today at a public hearing first told politicians his shareholders would have to foot the bill to compensate customers charged fees for no service, before admitting it was in fact the customers' own money being paid back to them. Media stocks were the worst performers. Shares in soon-to-be-wed Fairfax and Nine took a dive. After after Fairfax revealed a 5% slump in revenues. Overall, our market shrugged off the big falls in the US, where the Dow suffered another 2.1% fall. Another 1.3% was wiped off the tech-heavy Nasdaq. Europe took its lead from Wall Street, a small dip in Japan but a strong finish in Hong Kong. President Trump ramped up the rhetoric against the Federal Reserve's interest rate posture. He called the central bank crazy, said it was going, quote, loco. This chart gives us another clue as to what's influencing long-term US interest rates, quantitative easing, money printing, is being seriously wound back. The Fed's balance sheet is shrinking by almost $10 billion a week. The ABS housing finance data showed a bigger-than-expected fall in lending to owner-occupiers, but the decline in lending to investors is much bigger overall. Home loans are down overall 10% on the year, the biggest fall in seven and a half years. The Reserve Bank the bank released its semi-annual financial stability review today, which is the bank's assessment of current risks to the economy. In short, the RBA doesn't think there's much to worry about. Australian households, while more debt-laden than anyone in the world except the Swiss, are well-placed to pay off those debts despite being in the midst of the world's worst house price falls. And on the currencies, the Australian dollar house bounce, bounced back 1% over this torrid week, and that's finance. Australia's new look cricket team has held on for a character filled draw in the first test against Pakistan. A century from Usman Khawaja and sensible knocks from Travis Head and Tim Payne helped Australia survive a tense final day. Surrounded by most of the Pakistan team, the Australian captain stood tall. Oh, and he's done it. A little fist pump there by Tim Payne. What a monumental achievement from Australia. In its first test series since the ball tampering scandal ripped Australian cricket apart, Payne's team showed steely resistance. We never less lost hope, I suppose, that we could do that today. There was probably times where it was probably um, a bit of a dream, but um, I thought, yeah, we just fought, dug in and, and played a brand that Australian cricket team wants to play. After losing 10 wickets for 60 on day three, few gave Australia a chance of batting out day five. But Usman Khawaja followed his first innings 85 with a match-saving century. People think because of my relaxed nature that I've been gifted to be able to get to where I am, but it's not the case at all. I've worked my absolute backside off. Khawaja's near nine-hour vigil was the longest by an Australian in a fourth innings of a test. I was feeling pretty good for most of it until we got to probably about uh, the second session with one hour left just before tea and then I was withering, uh, you know, just asking for God to get the sun, sun down so I can get some shade. The left-hander was trapped on 141. Appeal and gone! Two more wickets and Pakistan was soaring. Take a magnificent piece of feeling. But Payne and Nathan Lyon resisted for 12 overs to secure a memorable draw. It shows a lot of, a lot of guts. Um, it shows a lot of courage to do something like that. Um, and hopefully we can take the momentum to the next game. The second and final test starts in Abu Dhabi on Tuesday. Duncan Huntsdale, ABC News. Australian tennis player Matt Ebden has advanced to the quarterfinals of the Shanghai Masters. The 30-year-old is enjoying one of his best years on tour. He was much too good for Germany's Peter Goyovchik, winning in straight sets. That's a great finish. Yeah, seven what a week Two Matt Ebden's having six here. Two, six, three. Back in the quarterfinals here in Shanghai. The game's tonight and Ebden's opponent is Croatia's Borna Choric. If he wins, he'll rise to a career-high 31st in the world rankings. And now with the weather, Paul Higgins. 
And Ian, it would have been a beautiful day for playing golf if only things had gone to plan. Anyway, plenty of time for that after tonight. It dropped to minus two at Falls Creek and Mount Hotham early today. They even had a dusting of spring snow the night before. Today, most of the state basked in sunshine. Just a bit of cloud out here in East Gippsland. Mildura was warmest with 26 degrees. It was a bit hard to throw back the doona this morning. Five or six in many suburbs. Today's city high, 22.7 degrees at 5.02 this afternoon. More showers streamed into Sydney along the coast today and uh, thunderstorms over southeast Queensland, although not as severe as yesterday's, which as we saw before brought tennis ball sized hail and even a tornado. In fact, most of these areas of cloud you see here over the interior have thunderstorms embedded in them, triggered by a number of pressure troughs. But we are under the spell of this high. The wind will go more northerly tomorrow. Now that trough to the west of us is slow moving, so it's a bit uncertain when and how much rain will arrive. Next Tuesday is probably the best bet. But we are in for a shower or two possible, anyway, on Sunday afternoon and on Monday. Tomorrow, Brisbane is in for a soaking 30 to 50 millimetres of rain there. In Sydney, showers will bring 2 to 8 millimetres and across in Perth up to 15 millimetres. It should be dry in Adelaide and also in Hobart. Well, back home, it won't be quite as cold as it was last night and then a mild to warm Saturday. In our western north, it'll be partly cloudy, but it should be mostly sunny everywhere else, apart from the far east where you could just pick up a shower or two. On the bays, a north to northeasterly wind at 10 to 15 knots, tending east to southeasterly in the afternoon. Strong winds on the Gippsland coasts. Well, cool and clear in Melbourne tonight and then a warm and sunny Saturday. Maybe a few clouds in the afternoon and a moderate northeasterly wind, 11 through to 23 degrees. And Melbourne pollen forecast is predicting moderate levels tomorrow and Sunday, so be ready for that. On Sunday, mostly sunny and not too cool for the Melbourne marathoners in the morning, a fresh northeast wind. Monday, a possible shower, 25. Tuesday, showers and possibly even thunderstorms in the afternoon and evening, 24. Wednesday, late showers, 24. Thursday, a clearing day and on Friday it'll be fine with a high of 27. And one more forecast tonight. A long and happy retirement for our Hendo. Ian, since you announced you were leaving, the accolades have been pouring in. It just goes to show how much a part of everyone's lives you've become. Along with all of your colleagues here at ABC News, I'll miss your camaraderie, your wisdom, your guiding hand in the newsroom, your eloquence, your wit and your fierce advocacy for journalistic standards. And so we farewell you with our heartiest good wishes and a little reminder of some of the highlights of your career. OK, what have we got to rehoist? Some days you feel really good, some days you don't feel quite so good, but generally now, uh, I think I know my audience pretty well and I'm really, really happy to be talking to them. Ian Henderson in the Melbourne newsroom. Talks are continuing on the GST amid claims the Democrats are split on the issue. Good evening, Ian Henderson with ABC News. I was based in London and we went to Germany, to Greece, to Russia, and all over the place. Despite the empty champagne bottles, the presence of so many troops and water cannon here on the eastern side of the Brandenburg Gate was a sobering reminder of political realities. Jubilant crowds gathered here outside Winnie Mandela's home for the fourth day running hoping to give her husband the welcome home for which he's waited nearly 30 years. The emotion of the commitment was undoubted. The test of the commitment is yet to come. At the end of day two, stubborn differences still divide the two superpowers. It's an historic and a highly emotional moment. For practical purposes, the Berlin Wall has been all but torn down. A crossing which in the past has claimed the lives of hundreds can now be made safely by joyous tens of thousands. Listen up, you lot. It's not all fun and games. This bit's serious. Melbourne's weather tomorrow? I've forgotten. In the studios of the ABC, but believe you me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Edward. All right, well, you better remember, at the other end of that lens, there's a nice, friendly person there who's looking at you, just trying okay. to get the best shot out of you. A little bit of personality just to hurt, okay. so give it a bit of warmth. He was furious to read a newspaper report suggesting he'd cheated on his wife. What was going on behind me there? It's currently 15 degrees in the city. Back with more news at 6 o'clock. Remember, this is your ABC, so have a great day. Very well done. I feel threatened. <laughs> Very flattering and just a little embarrassing, those haircuts. Uh, and that's it for this evening's program. And for me, 
The end of a long and happy stint at the ABC. Thank you for all your kind and thoughtful messages over the past fortnight and for welcoming, welcoming me into your homes all these years. It has been a rare privilege and a real pleasure. Over the years, we've experienced the highs and lows of live television together, of which last night was certainly one. But from tomorrow night, I join you on the other side of the TV screen and I'm very much looking forward to getting my news from the talent, my talented colleagues, Tamara O'Dine and Mary Gearan. Indeed, I'd, I'd like to thank all my colleagues, both behind the scenes and in front of the camera, whose hard work and diligence makes all this magic possible. To all of you, travel well, and should our paths cross down the track, make sure you say hello. For now, my best wishes and good night. <laughs>